Welcome everybody. I today what we're going to cover is something that I wish was in the toolkit in my life like last year because there's something really profound that we just stumbled across and that has to do with something I'm sure many of you already thought about and it's this idea that training is not enough. It's not working. There's something around just training reps is not getting the behavior change. And what I thought was really interesting, Jerry Farr posted this triangle that I think is a, an improvement on the Bloom's taxonomy about how we as adults learn, but also how we as leaders can encourage others to do. What most people check is the reaction. Uh, if I do a training, it's that survey afterwards. Like, how did you like the training? And if it's thumbs up, everybody's like, cool, I invested in something valuable, but that's not enough. The next level of it is how somebody actually took something away from what you covered? Did they learn something new? And this is more than just like what we were taught in school, which is like answering a multiple choice question. Can you understand what an impact versus critical event question is? That's not really it. What we are in the business of, we as leaders, is how do they actually do behavior change? It's not enough to know it, and it's not enough to just put in the effort it's the application of the knowledge to the effort, which is the behavior change. And this is the part that we have the most control over that we need to get a little bit better at understanding. Once we've nailed the behavior change, then it goes into results and then it goes into ROI at the top. Now, most people, because ROI is measured on revenue, bottom line, whatever, like it's too complex. So many things go into it that it's hard to say this training program or coaching program resulted in this style of behavior change. I wanted to start with this visualization because this will help us navigate one of the big learnings that happened and some of the results that I want to share you share with you today is we kind of already feel all of this. We know that just checking for reactions isn't enough. We also know that like the ideal, like any investment, like we want to see return on it. But if we can't attribute the work that we're doing with the results that we're getting, it doesn't quite work. But let's jump into some of the data. What I found was really interesting is I wanna share with you like what is the experiment that we just ran and what are some of the key learnings that took away from it? I'll share with you some of the data, somewhat shocking as we did an A-B test. And then what does this mean? And we'll go into the applications about how do we apply AI to help solve some of these really big picture stuff. Now, I realize I'm jumping straight into it. So let me set the stage. I'm gonna be writing on here. I'm gonna be sharing some stuff. You can, at the top right, zoom into me and like pin my screen, or if you wanna see everybody's reactions to it. Uh, Roey is also gonna be presenting today and he'll be helping manage the chat. And when either one of us is not speaking, the other one will be engaging. So pop your questions in the chat or ideas on what else you're using in AI to make things work. I want keep this to be a very engaging session. I see a lot of familiar faces, so I'm sure you've been on one of ours in the past, but if not, enjoy the ride. Let's jump into- the, 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 uh, Funny funny oh. note, there's a AI bot, uh, just it's starting to engage in the chat by itself. So that's, ah. that's the first I'm seeing. Yeah, I, I think it's a fantastic way. Yeah, that's a really good shout out. Like all of the, there's so many tools coming out. Like we, it's important to see like which ones work, which ones are we're still experimenting with. Um, but that's a good shout out. Okay, let's jump into some of the results. So basically what I'm showing you on this screen, there's two things. I, group A and group B. The top is asking around like, did they ask an impact question or did they do a critical event? Now, group A, as you can see, they started off 30% and they grew to 90%. And based on my opening today, I, I imagine you have a hypothesis why. Versus group B, they're a little bit more senior. They were already applying this, uh, asking impact questions, but they got relatively very little improvement. Now, both of these groups had 20 to 25 reps and about five managers in. And we went through a process where we did a training as a deep dive on one particular topic. And we said like, these are the skills that we want you to start applying. And then we had three weekly coaching sessions. We're terming that as a sprint. And based on what I'm seeing, like, sprints are a really powerful way to actually get behavior change. And some of those like 
takeaways that we heard from people afterwards is like by going deep and then reinforcing it week over week, it helped offset a lot of what people are feeling. Like the market is dramatic right now. We're all facing macroeconomic headwinds that are challenging. Things in the business are to solve for that often changing, which can add a lot of pressure on reps. Getting deals are harder. Emails aren't working anymore. People's budgets are now being more complexly distributed. There's a lot of challenges going on. And how it played out between these two groups was really fascinating. What else we noticed is that the critical event questions, we know that those are somewhat harder for people to capture. And to be honest, we tried to make this relatively easy. The goal of this was to everybody be able to earn 100%. But one of the shocking things that came out of it is that training alone didn't do anything. We only started measuring after the first training session. And in that training, they were taught everything that they needed in order to be successful. But what we started to realize is that these results that we're seeing over here, these results happened because of coaching. Some of the best performing reps had the most engaging managers. And most managers that I work with love coaching as their job like that's the best part of their job but most people can't find the time to do it and spoiler alert ai i think has the most power to help with frontline managers ai is helpful uh, different lms are really helpful with um, developers and other things i think the coaching aspect of ai is going to be incredible and there's a couple of, like psychological reasons why but let's talk about like this particular data point. Uh, I'll zoom in on this chart on the right. So it's a little bit easier to see. What we notice is that within group B, there was a dramatic shift. The managers that were most engaged in coaching, and this was measured by giving specific feedback from, on each call week over week, they saw significant improvement over the reps who were participating in all of the same things, given all the same tools, than reps who did not get coaching. And this, there's probably some confounding variables, like they feel invested in versus just the coaching alone. But this is a very interesting data point that helps justify a lot of the things that we're feeling. And I hope can help you as leaders start to realize the power of coaching and investing in coaching for your team. Now, investing doesn't mean hiring outside people. It does mean giving your coaches the tools to be able to coach. And as part of the priorities, knowing that this isn't just a nice to have, but if you're trying to get outsized results based on limited resources, it's a really powerful way to move forward. If there's questions ben, on this, I'll see yeah, you over. Ben, there's, yeah, a, there's a question from Tom. Uh, where's the research from and what is the sample size? Hey, Tom, nice to see you again. So, Tom, the research is from me, and the research, this is like data that's hot off the press. The sample size is about 20, 25 reps per each uh, cohort that we ran this through. Now, this has similar results onto something that I've shared in the past that's based off a sample size of 58,000 sales opportunities. Um, I do not have slides prepared for that, but because we're talking a little sciencey before we go into like what are the solutions to it, Something fascinating that came out of that, which is why I built this experiment to be a little bit more narrow and focused on coaching, was that we noticed that 68% of the reps that went through a transformation cycle, training, coaching, their managers were trained on how to coach, 68% of the reps basically didn't have any behavior change. The next tier, 24% of reps, they transformed into more of a transactional to consultative sales approach. They started diving into impact and critical event on their sales opportunities versus just keeping it transactional, like understanding the situation, like what tools they're using, the size, et cetera. But the top 4% of reps went through something more provocative. They were able to uncover the decision criteria and navigate the decision process. And what's fascinating, each jump resulted in 40 to 60% improvement in ACV, but this top tier rep had their close rates go up, their win rates go up by 10% and their average ACV just over 2X. And so this is another example that we know that people who are receptive to coaching can get outsized results. What's fascinating, even though two thirds of the team, about 68%
didn't really use the training to change any of their significant behavior. The ROI in six months from this coaching and transformation initiative was 9x just on new business. And as a recurring revenue, we know that the five-year horizon would be much more dramatic. And so if we calculated it out and then also imply what the upsell or cross-sell opportunities could be because of the net new opportunities that were brought in because of this initiative, we started calculating at over five years, this could be about a 48x ROI. These are hard numbers to measure specifically. I go back to this ROI is like, there's a lot of confounding variables within it. Process needs to be there. Coaching culture needs to be there. Priorities so leaders can focus on coaching needs to be there. And most teams have are coming in at a different level from understanding how they can get coaching. Are they receptive to it? Or do they feel attacked? But there's a psychological thing that happens that AI is really valuable for, which is I don't feel attacked when I run my transcript through an AI bot and I get scored. Does anybody, I want that, let's keep this in the chat for a bit. Does anybody know like what is the psychological reason about why I don't feel as attacked when AI is scoring me versus my manager or a peer giving feedback on one of my calls? Maybe people think it's more objective, it's more scientific, it's less personal, it's maybe more accurate. So then maybe people will get less angst <laughs> if it's coming from AI versus versus me or you, Dan. <laughs> That's right. It's, it takes out, it's, it gives it that third party feel to it. It's like, well, this is what somebody else was thinking and I don't have that direct relationship to them. And as many of you know, reps don't love doing role plays, but if we practice with a bot, it has a different feeling to it. I think we're just at the cusp of the, well, how exciting that is, is we can get people to practice and get behavior change in different ways than we've been able to before by using AI in the right way. How I'm gonna show you in a few minutes is AI can score calls. It can say, here are the three things I recommend that you focus on. And now the manager can focus on what I, I'm lovingly terming the OBT. I know we all need more acronyms in our life, but what is the one big thing to focus on? So AI can score it. It can now score across the team in seconds versus taking hours of a coach's time to review calls every week. But now the manager can review the transcript, review the calls, go to specific timestamps, and then find the one big thing, taking into the context of what they know about this rep. Potentially, they just lost a big deal and they might have some emotional baggage with that. They might be a ramping rep and they're just starting to get a sense of what stories they can share. But now I want to go into how coaches can best coach. We're going to give you a few tools, but this is ultimately a hybrid approach. The human element of this, as I showed you in the data before, is essential. A manager that invests personally with their reps one-on-one -on -one, gets outsized results. It's the 14% versus the 60% improvement. So if we as leaders need to get that, how do we better coach? AI can now spot check and go through all the calls and flag certain things. Like I was evaluating you on this and this is the results that I got. But now we can start shifting the mindset to say like, well, here's what the system came out with. And if it's very confronting, we can now say, well, I don't exactly agree. The transcript's not perfect or the AI doesn't, fully understand the context of what you were describing. And so I think this is where it becomes really fascinating. Rowie, I'd like to share, let's start over with a more simplistic example, which is just based off of emails. So I'd love for you to share how we're thinking about scoring emails and then using AI to improve it. And then we'll start transitioning into calls and a couple other really fascinating examples about how AI can help with demos across the world, and the future applications that we're starting to see. So Rui, over to you. All right, sounds good. I'm gonna share my screen because I want this to be in high res. So that's that. So first step, I'm going to have ChatGPT create a rubric for us, right? And we use rubrics uh, in order to evaluate. Um, Dan, when I joined Winning by Design, we used to score 
when we did this analysis, a scale analysis, we used to score emails and score, uh, score calls. We moved away from scoring into rubrics. Um, I think that was your initiative. Do you mind sharing why we did this and why we prefer to use rubrics now? So ultimately, they're, they're trying to solve something similar. So rubrics allows everybody to understand what we're being scored on. So I mentioned before that psychology of getting defensive. And when you're defensive, you're not really learning. You're kind of in that fight or flight. And you don't actually form new memories when epinephrine and adrenaline is running through your system. So in order to create a safe space, a positive coaching culture, one of the things that helps is for people to understand exactly how they're going to be scored. Rubrics define what do we mean by approaching expectations versus meeting expectations. Scores were all programmed from school to try and get an A, trying to get 100%, and it can be somewhat misleading. Rubrics just allow you to see, based on a certain criteria, are you meeting or approaching expectations? And we found this to be really helpful because the holy grail of coaching comes from peer-to-peer -peer coaching, not top-down leader to rep coaching, for example, or teacher to student coaching. It's how do we learn best from each other with a shared framework, a shared process, shared understanding of what good looks like. Thank you. All right, so the first prompt, I'm going to ask ChatGPT to create a rubric for us. Um, all right, so this is the prompt. You're a sales training coach and you want to create a coaching rubric for scoring a uh, prospecting email. This is an example. The rubric should have three levels, approaching expectation, meets expectations, and exceeding expectation. I will share with you a framework of an email. Do you understand, right? So that's the first prompt. And I do this step-by-step. -step. Of course, you can do a larger, longer prompt, but yeah. And of course it tells me it understands and uh, repeats what I told it. Now, one way for us to create that is for me just to go and for now I'm using winning by design uh, RRR framework. So I'm just going to copy paste this. I can download it as a PDF where I can just copy paste and this specific, oops, this specific content explains according to our um, our framework, what a good email looks like. So I'm going to feed that. I'm going to, to teach ChatGPT the RRR framework. So copy paste it, of course. And it tells me that he understands this. And now it's going to create a rubric for prospecting emails. All right, and of course it gives me um, in a table and it gives me, for example, one criteria is relevance and what is uh, approaching expectation, limited or no research, generic opening lines, meeting expectation, adequate research, showing familiarity with the prospect and their industry opening lines indicate some level of understanding or exceeding expectation, extensive research, uh, possibly citing past interaction or specific pain points, Opening lines immediately grab attention due to its uh, personalized and relevant nature. So we have different criteria, again, based on the copy paste that I did from Winning by Design Blueprint, right? So relevance, reward, request, email length, mobile optimization, and subject line. Then how would you score this rubric as this? Uh... It's solid. I, and I think another element, I know you asked earlier about the difference between scorecard and rubric. It's more of just a shared language and making sure that we're defining everything in the same way because a reward might mean something different to each of your reps but if we say this is how you will be scored and this is how the ai will score you now we have a natural tendency to try and game the system or trying to get that 100 percent. but if it's based off of this definition now everybody has an equal playing field and it doesn't take into account um, favoritism or other biases unconscious biases that we might have so yes, mm -hmm. this looks as a solid start as any. Now, when I test, tested it, um, it wasn't 100% how I would do the rubrics, but it's like 90%, right? So I just need, if I would have time, I would have done a few tweaks here and there and additional criteria that we would like to, that we usually like to look into. 
but let's say let's use that for uh, the sake of today's example. So now let's evaluate this email, and I'm taking here an email that I grabbed off the internet. Um, right. So this email is like, um, "Hi, uh, so you're part of six percent, blah blah blah." Let uh, let me share you a quick case study, few numbers here. Um, not sure relevant, but would we would it be worth uh, for us to have a quick chat, right? This is normal email prospecting cold outreach email. And one of the things that we allow this, instead of us doing this manually, we can feed a lot of emails like that, right? And then based on the criteria that it generated uh, before, Right in terms of relevance, meet expectations, uh, reward, meet expectation, meet expectation, exceeding expectation, email length, etc. And then it gives me some pointers here. Right, the email opened with a, a, stati a st stat statistic, possibly uh, trying to connect, etc. So, gave me the rubrics, the assessment, and then the reasoning behind that. Now. The kicker here is that I can ask him to create, to improve that email, right? So now recreate this email to exceed expectation in all rubrics. And this is where it starts to get interesting. And now we're moving not only from coaching, but actually a tool that each individual can use uh, in their day-to-day -day job, right? So certainly let's aim to elevate the email, exceed expectation in all criteria, gives me a subject line, and this is a pretty solid example of an email, right? Case study, bullet points, and let's see the call to action. Um, would you be open to a 15 minute discussion this week to explore how these insights could be uh, applicable? Could be, um, yeah, I think it's pretty solid. So that's how we build a rubric, test, uh, an email and then have it correct it or improve the email that we generated. Uh, I, love, I love you sharing this. I actually did this on somebody who spammed me and I put their email through my rubric and I asked and I suggested back to them. I said, hey, reading this email, it came across that you didn't actually do any research on me. Uh, he also sent me a video of himself, you know, holding up like a whiteboard with my name on it. And those have now been spammed so much. I'm like, uh, but let me see, because it had my like website scrolling through the background. And I go over to it and it's this super fake video of like a bot just scraping and just scrolling up and down on our webpage. So he faked the video, it hasn't actually done any research on me. No, nothing compelling that, that email, the language, like, yes, it has my name and my company name and title in it, but like super easy to scrape. And so I went back to him and said, hey, this email felt like spam to me. And I ran it through my prospecting scorecard and it scored a nine out of 15. But I also asked it to improve the email. How would it score 15 out of 15? And this was the results. I hope that this helps you uh, see how you could be writing your emails differently. Now, as Rowie and I are exploring this, I realized that this is probably something interesting for the next three, six months. I'm sure all of you have started getting spam AI emails and it's now somewhat easy. Like they're better than emails from five, 10 years ago, but they still are fake. It still doesn't have that connection where I'm like, ah, I don't want to do it. And there's something around the intent that matters greatly to us as humans, not AI. And the fact that people are faking it just rubs everybody the wrong way. It's like starts a relationship off on the wrong foot. I think email automation is going to get like uh, super commoditized. I think it's not going to work as much anymore. So like it's going to start ramping up a lot. Email is going to be even less effective <clears throat> than it is now, even though the emails are now starting to optimize towards that last 1%. AI will be interesting there, but that's not where we're going to have the biggest bang for buck. Where it becomes valuable is where it can augment the stuff that we don't love doing. And now I want to transition to a couple examples. I want to show you more deeply about how I as a human manually shared those results earlier and how AI can start doing that in my next test. How close can we get the AI to start acting as coaches for our reps? So let me jump into 
Um, actually, let me try it through my screen. <clears throat> I'll jump over it now. I know that you did the advanced sharing. Roe, is it still blurry on this side? Should I just do normal screen share? I think so. It's blurry on my end. OK, let me just do normal. Um, if anybody ends up doing something similar like this, Roe and I found the hack in Zoom to make it not blurry would be using advanced screen share settings, going to your second camera, cycling through. But let me just share a little bit quickly about how our experiment ran. To equal the playing field, we, in this sprint, asked everybody to ask an impact and critical event question. We trained them on how to do that, and then we gave them the step-by-step -step on how they should plan to spend 15 to 30 minutes a week on self-scoring. Now, that idea has the biggest behavior change. People are more uh, reactive to whatever they're seeing themselves put out there. Everyone complains about how their voice sounds on video, but ultimately, like them seeing themselves is a great differentiator. Many of the coaches that I worked with in that group B were like, I do coaching by sitting on the calls live. And that's somewhat delusional. People think that like what they hear and their memory after the call is accurate. But when you go back to the transcript and say, can you point me out the timestamp of where you actually asked an impact question? Then be like, oh, I actually, I didn't see it. But seeing their peers do it and then like, oh, there's different ways of doing it. That's what really happens here. So what I'm sharing with you here is the three different approaches. Now, I might just make this two. I noticed that I tended to not ever give anybody exceeds, even though everybody wants to do it. But I define exceeds as like, it's so good, you'll train every future rep based off of this call example. Most people, like when they start off, they're like, oh, 80% of my stuff is exceeds. And we had one rep do that where he scored himself basically an 86%. And the coach and us as the certified coach here, we give them about 47%. Like they were missing all of these key things and they didn't know how to self-diagnose. So now this rubric becomes a very valuable tool. And then how this comes out, I believe very strongly in visualizing the scorecard. So everybody can see exactly where they are. I sometimes call this the CrossFit effect. Everybody wants to look around and see like how they compare so we would have the rep's name here, the manager's name here, and then you would see how they self-score and then the key differences across. One rep would self-score very low and then they would actually earn very high. And it's also a helpful tool for them to see like, am I being self-reflective enough? So let's go into the first reps. Now I built it like this so anybody could do it. I'm trying to use like free tools as much as possible. So every this feels accessible. There's a ton of amazing AI coaching tools that are coming out right now. And there's ways to integrate that with other systems, but sometimes just doing it somewhat manually just gets the results, gets people in it, and just you don't have now an excuse of the technology not working. So here's the overall framework. I suggest, or I give feedback to managers. The best way for you to give feedback is first on process. Did they actually follow the thing that you wanted to? And then on the quality, and I'm terming that delivery. They then go over here and each score has meets, approaching, et cetera, and it's mapped back to the rubric. I found this to be a very powerful way for people to think about how they can hold themselves accountable to whatever they're trying to do. Now, the rosebud thorn is also a self-reflection that you can put in, like, what is going really well? What is something I tried that like, needs a little bit more? And what's something that I did that I shouldn't do anymore? And so having some like written responses there has been great. And then timestamping, actually putting the notes of like, when did this actually happen? Now, something interesting that I noticed is that when we're coaching reps, even on this somewhat simplistic scorecard, like we're being very specific on the skill we're evaluating for impact and critical event. I noticed that when people tried to apply research, a lot of it sounded like uh, Jim, I did a lot of research on your company. Um, I'd love to hear from you, like, what is your role and some of the top priorities that you're working on? And I would score that as an absolute zero. Like, you didn't apply any, like, you're telling people you did research, you actually didn't. And it was across the board. Most reps learn from somebody else that that's how you open up calls. And it ends up being a really, when you evaluate it, you can, like, see, like, oh, that's not good. But most people just gloss over and they're like, oh, I'm nailing it. Like, I'm showing up prepared. And you're not. And AI can be really helpful there. And I'm about to share with you like one super easy tool. It was like a eureka moment. I got really giddy about it once I finally figured it out. But 
one easy way to do it is saying like, I know I'm about to get on a call with a project management solution like Asana or Monday. And I'm sure I have a customer story that might come up and be relevant. Now, what's interesting data, I'm gonna now self-justify because Tom was like, hey, where'd the numbers come from? Like to give proper scope, we did one call per week for rep. And so for group A, that was 58 calls. For group B, it was just under 70 calls. So almost 150 calls across the month that we did this program. And I, in my readout to them, I suggested the managers like, how many stories, how many customer stories do you think came up on across those 150 calls? Zero. None of the reps were telling customer stories. And this feels like such like a missing powerful thing, especially for new reps that are just trying to like understand how to communicate with people, but sharing stories can be so powerful. So I want to share with you um, a way that you can start doing that. I will pull up, let me see if I did it. Okay. I'm going to share this link with everybody afterwards, but I built out a prompt just like Roe shared earlier. And one of the techniques that we found to be really valuable is you have to teach the system. Like right now we're using chat GPT, but it's the same for all LLMs. You have to teach the system, like what is the context that you're asking for? So we say you're an enablement expert and you're teaching sales professionals how to tell a story. The goal is that they will tell the story in less than 300 words. And it comes across three parts. The rest of this prompt, I'm teaching them about the three parts. So I'm gonna scroll through so you can see like, this is how you tell a good story. Here are the things to avoid. And then here's the structure. End with a question like these are the examples. And when done correctly, the answer to those questions will be like, yes, how does this company solve that? <clears throat> now, another thing that we found really valuable is just testing it out. And so this is what I wanted to do. I said, go through this. Here's the prompt. Here's what I want you to do. Once you've understood how I've trained you above, ask me this question. And so it says, understood. Please put in the case study. And so this is what I did. I went to Asana. I pulled up one of their case studies, Zoom. I tried to use the link and that's like hit and miss. Sometimes you can just copy paste the URL. But ultimately all I did was I just like copied it. I just went all the way down copied this public facing case study. So that means any of their reps can do this or any of your reps can use the same prompt and use the same thing with any of your published case study. And I was giddy with the response, right? I put in this like somewhat unstructured, blah, 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 case study, copy, paste, and then check out what it does. It starts off with the words that I want. And so now all they need to do in basically two minutes of work, prep before a meeting, they can say, hey, I'm about to jump on the call and here's how I tell a compelling customer story. Now our framework uses the simplified hero's journey. So it makes it personal at the start and there's some psychology around why. Then it goes into the pain and tries to go deep into the negative impact of it not being solved. And then what happened? Now, this isn't a perfect story. There's things that like as a human, I would augment and say, oh, there's ways to improve it. For example, make it less about Asana being a hero and more about Gregory. Like, what did he do to do that? Now, those are tweaks that a human coach can do. And I'm sure with right prompt engineering, we could get better at that on here. But just on its own, showing up prepared for a call with a similar customer and being able to read off of it like this, this is what product marketing and product enablement is trying to figure out for decades. And it's now free. It's easy for anybody to use from any published case study. So I'm really excited to share that with you. That's something that I, I would love in, in a future experiment to run. Like, what is the win rate on deals where reps actually tell stories? But now we have some, some sort of quality control where it can be a good story. A lot of the stories that salespeople tell is like, oh, you know, I was just working with a customer just like you. And they were also complaining about the lack of collaboration. It was really painful. But after using monday.com, they were able to blank. And most people tell stories like that, but it's very sales centric. It's very marketing centric. It doesn't have that human element that makes a story so great. And now we have the tools to do it. So, Dan, there's a question from uh, Renee. Good. Renee, what's up? Uh, I'll read it out. So um, basically what she's saying uh, was something that we, you and I played around with. Uh, how do we analyze 
long transcripts of calls. Like the one hours yeah. that that ChatGPT has a limit and what we can upload, uh, and how do we solve that? Okay, well, my favorite. Or just to allow it, we have also tried with Claude, which has a hundred k, and then there was a mixed bag of result of results. So that's another challenge because it starts mixing, uh, losing details the longer the transcripts are. Right, so oh, that's the yeah. challenge. So oh, I know it's and it's so painful because like. The hallucinations sound real. Like if you don't catch it, then it sounds like it's making it up. So, um, Roe, actually, I noticed in one of your examples, you're using what Derek shared with us about like a custom intro. Will you get that ready? I'll come to you in a second because I think that will help what Renee is describing. Um, yeah. Renee, you were bringing up a specific limitation to Chat GPT, and LLMs are continuing to grow and evolve. But one of my favorite uh, workarounds for this is a company called Assembly AI has an LLM called Lemur, and it's based off of an audio style input versus ChatGPT is a text style input. And something that I was, this is their free playgrounds. I'm also trying to just find tools and ways that you can use things for free. So Lemur is a fantastic example. And, and what I'm showing here is a, now my next example is if I'm going into a public company, let's say I'm trying to prospect into Square, I just Googled like, what is the 10Q for Square? I came up with their audio file. And like you mentioned, this is like an hour long thing. I downloaded it. I then uploaded it as an audio file to Lemur. I did this before our session because it took about five, 10 minutes for it to transcribe. But now the transcription is all here. And then you can start messing around with the different questions. What are the top three initiatives for the sales team in this year? What are some of the marketing results that they found? What are the executive priorities? That, and so now this is another tool. So I've given the storytelling and now the 10K, 10Q, like just arming your team to show up with research. And that augment that, sorry, that counteracts that feeling that we're all starting to get where we're feeling spammed around everything. Reps just show up because they're being pushed in so many directions that like they don't have time to actually research or they don't even quite know where to go. And now these are two tricks, two tips that they can use in less than five minutes before I recall, they show up and sound like a true expert. I understand your executive priorities based on what I've seen, your CEO post, CEO post in a blog article in the last six months, your recent 10Q or 10K filings, like I've probed it and I noticed this was an initiative. Did I get that right? And it completely redefined how reps show up for a call. So I hope that this helps answer that question. Other ways is if you buy the subscription for ChatGPT that has a longer transcription limit and there's tons of other LLMs coming out, BARD and others that have different variations of uh, limitations to hopefully get around that. Another interesting thing, sorry, I, I'm blabbing a little bit, but I'm just so excited about what this can do. Like I use this with one of our own internal calls. We had a, a customer that we had to switch around different salespeople and get different executive alignment. And using this, I think you can put in like a hundred hours worth of audio or video. And using this tool, I stitched together the four discovery calls that we had with various executives, stitched it into it. And I found the results. So to kind of counteract what you were saying, Renee, like it kind of blended everything. In this case, it was good. So we spoke to different people and they had different challenges. And now I could, based on the transcript, say like, what does the director of sales care about? What does the CMO care about? And I could just query all of the discovery calls that my team had done up to that point and create a really nice executive summary to say, Derek, I need you to show up on this call. This is what you need to know. Here's our situation, pain. Here's the top three impacts. Sales cares about this. Marketing cares about this. And here's the big CEO initiative that aligns everybody. And now I can use ChatGPT to help create that executive summary. Sorry, I'm saying ChatGPT is like, but in this case, it was Lemur, helped create that summary. And now he shows up looking like an expert with only five minutes of prep before. Does that help answer the question? I saw that your text had a, a bunch of different sub questions in there, but does that resonate? Yes, it does. It's very interesting. I'll try it out. I was just okay. thinking if you. If you do these executive summaries, you can also use this for consulting work. Yes. <laughs> yes. Um, 
<laughs> we actually we saw something alarming happened. I think that playbooks are starting to become very easily done on AI. So this type of thing, and we've noticed that a big part of our business that was focused on building customized playbook now can be augmented so easily with AI that it's just it's this feeling that I'm sure a lot of us are getting. There's a quote, and I'm going to completely butcher it, but it's not that AI will replace all of our jobs. It's just going to replace the jobs of people not using AI in their job. So it's an awkwardly paraphrased quote to it. But to your point, it's like, if like, this is now like, this is available. This is the new world. And I know we're joking a little bit about it, but there is something that one of my colleagues shared with me and I'm still wrapping my head around like the implications of it. But I want to show you like how AI can now be helpful in demos. So not only did I learn how to write backwards and talk at the same time on my fancy light board, but in my spare time, I learned German. Willkommen zur Online-Lernreise. Du erlebst eine Überraschung, um die Vergessenskurve zu bekämpfen. Normalerweise vergisst man Gelerntes schnell, etwa 40% nach einem Tag, 90% nach 30 Tagen. Was wir tun, ist, dass du dich darauf konzentrierst. Okay. It matched my voice. It matched my pacing. It changed how my lips move. So it looks like I'm actually speaking German. I, this is so wild. And obviously there's a lot of like, my brain goes to like the negative like implications. Like now anything that I can say, like anything can be, and that's fine. But now let's talk about the positive element of it. We all know that one of the most valuable ways of selling inside a complex organization is internal selling. And if we're going cross-functional across the entire world and we believe in this behavior change based off of a consistent process across the entire GTM, this is the future. I can now share insights or learnings or trainings or coaching across any language that my team is working on. Now, the Japanese team can learn from the Dutch team. And they can figure out very interesting ways that they can navigate who should be saying what to when. And we can now have thoughtful conversations. It's like Brazilians, they need to, I, I don't mean to sound this negatively, but I've noticed in Brazil, like if you get into business right away, you sound a little bit curt. Like it's better to start off and ask about the family or how things have been or what's going on and just like warming up the conversation. But if I speak to Germans, and I asked them about how their two-year-old's birthday party went this weekend. It's a little invasive. Like, don't start off with those kind of... And so now there's cultural dynamics, but we need to have a consistent process on how we're doing things so that we can learn across the globe. But as far as demos go, now what we can have is say, hey, we have somebody that, like, the New York team believes in this, the London team believes in this, but the German team doesn't quite know how this would work. And now I can send over a demo that I created and it's completely converted. It sounds like me, it looks like me, and it gives a consistent feel. So now language is no longer the blocker. So I thought that that was a really fascinating new case study. We're just on the edge of trying to figure out how to do that. I wanna pause there since I got really excited about it because here's like, actually I wanna do the, the funny like downside of it. Even though this is super cool, I have other like coaching videos where I speak with my colleague das andere Element. And just like Renee and I were joking around hallucinations being annoying, um, I want to show you how that can look like when AI hallucinates a little bit. Kraftvolle Art, die Kombination zu starten. Aber was sollten Sie nicht tun? Mir bei dieser Stakeholder-Forschung nicht auf der ersten Seite nach wichtigen Informationen schauen. Um, aber wir müssen tiefer gehen. Was hat TJ in den Kommentaren gesagt und wie hat so I shared this with Mia and we had a good contagious laughter situation for a few minutes there. It's it's just so funny, like how close it can get. And then in like slightly wrong context, it can mix things up. So with that said, I wanted to share a few of the things that we're working on. Some of them, like what we know will work based around coaching and tracking behavior change and seeing improvement over time. Some of the systems that you can put in place when you've identified where your team needs the most help around deal coaching. For example, showing up prepared, using stories, digesting complex information like 10Ks or 10Qs. So you show up like an expert and then being more nuanced with how you're giving feedback. 
So you can train ChatGPT to highlight what are three coaching questions that you can ask. And just before we started recording, Tom mentioned like this is also a helpful tool he's been using in interviews, helping come up with what are the exercises that you can prompt new employees to run through. As you're onboarding reps, what are the milestones that you're looking for them to accomplish on live calls with customers so that you can make sure that they're trending in the right direction and you also have examples of what good looks like. So we hope to continue this type of conversation and start exploring all the exciting things that are happening around with AI. But we found what we thought about for today is that using AI for coaching feels like the low hanging fruit because we don't have time to do it, but we get outsized results when we do it. Does anybody have any questions or anything that you've been experimenting around using AI for coaching? Yeah, then there are two questions. Uh, Eric, do you want to come off mute or should I? Sure. Um, without a hint of trying to scare anyone, this happened to me. So I'm a consultant and I rely heavily on the AI transcript to give myself my own action items. And I came across a four paragraph long violent racist rant from one of my business partners in the transcript that just didn't happen so like out of thin air it generated crazy is not a strong enough word for what was there and why i say that is the thought i first had was how can i ever tell clients to rely on this and what could i tell them to avoid that outcome i'm certainly not going to lead with that story but in this room i feel comfortable asking about it is there any kind of like a sane fail safe that won't pull us all into paranoia where we can double check this stuff as we're scaling it because um i can't even explain how bad it would have been if i had just sort of shipped from that transcript um and it really opened my eyes I, thank you for sharing that cautionary tale i think that we are in this awkward teenage years of teenage drivers type of thing like i remember when Tesla's first came out with auto drive, like they always have that warning, like make sure that you are keeping both hands on the wheel. And you know that 90% of the drivers are just like, how cool is this? And they're pretending to text. And then you put in all of these other fail safes there. What you're bringing up is it looks so close. Just like Mia talking in German, but with my voice, like it is so close, but it's not actually that intelligent. There's things that we still need to control. And if it's valuable and you're worried that, reputations on the line or something else like it has to be spot checked so one of the systems and roey i think this was uh relevant to those custom introductions that i was sharing with you you can put in um requests in chat gpt but also all of the others where you tell it not to create information that doesn't have uh, a root in what actually happened so in my storytelling prompt for example I encourage it to go into the pain and then the negative impact of what would have happened if they didn't solve it within a certain amount of time. Most stories don't have that written out. Most people don't write out like, would have lost my job, would have to go through a round of layoffs, like product would have been delayed and one of our key customers would have left. Like they don't write that out in the story. And so without putting in a fail safe, like don't make up information if it's not there, just highlight after that you need more information to be more complete. If you don't do that, then it will create things like that. I luckily have not experienced what you just shared, but it's out there and I've heard other stories like that as well. And I don't think there's a non-human, 100% safe way of checking for that beyond just making sure that everything that you ship out to clients, including emails or summaries that are AI generated, they need to be proofread because the risk of getting it wrong far outweighs the benefit of the time savings of doing it right. So it's not a ship it and forget it. It's still in a, you need to be able to control the output. Uh, Rui, did you have a another way to augment that answer for what Eric was describing? No, continue to be scared that that like, for example, we, we don't upload any customer proprietary information right now, right? Until we understand what is really going on there, right? So. That's why we're kind of limited in what everything is is under the R and D uh, uh, sphere at Winning by Design, right? No customer information. Yeah, we are also very cautious. Dan, can you can you guys hear me? 
Yes. Yeah. Oh. You. Yeah. So about about this question, I use a lot the custom instructions inside GPT Chat GPT. I just I just added there a uh, screenshot. And for me, I I spend a lot of time uh, limiting the way and and what I want ChatGPT to consider in my in my every prompt that I input. So I think this is the best way. Uh, uh, a good example is that we are working with uh, uh, General Motors here in Brazil, and they have this Onyx car, which is also a name of a of a stone, right? So people were talking to to our chat that there was a play there, and they were actually ChatGPT was actually uh, answering about the stone, so it was completely nonsense. So we said, no, 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 you have to consider this and this and this and this. So once you you have your custom instructions aligned, all these limitations, all all these delusions, uh, tend to go away. I think this is, I mean, work a lot on your custom instructions because you can say who you are, what you want, what is the tone, and then you have, and you have all all of this, uh, configured. Yeah. It reminds me when. I used to work for a company we did uh, business intelligent uh, SaaS, right? And we did a project or, or we, we delivered a, a product for a health and beauty company. And apparently mascara, the product, is mask in, in Portuguese, right, Pedro? Yeah, you're right. We did an entire analysis based on we thought we we're going to get mascara results, like the, the the mascara that you put on your face. And then we got a lot of masks. Uh, so oh, we yeah, got makes sense. entire. Yeah, that was uh, our own dumb AI scraping tool that we had. So it reminds me of that. We have another question, Dan, uh, from Spencer. Spencer. Yeah, thank you so much for this. Super interesting. Um, I've used in the past, you know, before ChatGPT, like Gong and things like of that. Are there other platforms that you've used that you think require maybe a little less customization um, that are get out of the box? What are you trying to get out of the box? Well, you know, like feedback, like you said, if you're trying to do coaching analysis, um, I find it to be a little generic. That was kind of the problem on a lot of it, right? Is there like a good hybrid between um, having what you were able to to deliver, but required you know some prompts in, in there with some out, more out of the box platforms that you've come across? I think we're on the cusp of so many awesome tools. I did a demo of replays, and I it was really fascinating. So if you are looking for more out of the box, like what they have done, that's really powerful is they spend a long time with the prompt engineering. And so it's all things that technically you could do on your own, but there's been a lot of smart people working on this to customize it, make it out of the box and easier for you. So I think that tools like this would be a fantastic place to start. Um, most people who are in budget crisis right now, like are not investing in other tools. And so now if you do have Chorus or you do have Gong, how do you maximize those tools? Now, Chorus, I, I, it's not a proper, I think it's called keyword tracking, but Gong has keyword tracking and smart tracking. I made a stupid joke or I was going to call it smart tracking versus dumb trackers, but like, that's not actually what it's called. So keyword tracker is more like looking for the keywords within a transcript. Like, did they say, does that resonate? Or did they say impact when they were asking a question versus smart trackers are more like what chat GPT is, is they're able to infer the intent behind things, but it requires a lot of training. But all of these tools that have been out before AI hit the boom, like Outreach and Gong, like they're all now starting to adapt. Like I just saw in Gong yesterday, a new like call summary feature. And last year, Sybil came out with a fantastic feature. I think like ChatGPT launched in November and Sybil came out in December, like they were on it and it was awesome and it continues to be awesome. And so there's so many different tools that are out there that are just making our lives like way better than they were a year ago. I know we're also on the cusp of like tools that will be exceptional, that will do things that we weren't really able to do. And we're just in that like figuring out phase. Like I, it must feel like the 90s going to the 2000s where it's like, what is the internet actually going to do to transform everybody? And I think we're right there. So I don't have anything like out of the box that I can tell you, but I will continue to share with you like certain prompts and things that I've been using 
Um, for example, one other thing that I'll, I'll share over in a follow-up email is I put in another, uh, it's not, it's not going to look great, but forgive me, but this is like what you'll see. And it is like a coaching scorecard. And I wrote out the prompt of that um, scorecard that I just shared with you is defining what impact is, defining what critical event is, like defining meets versus approaching those, that rubric that I shared with you. How do you put that into a prompt? Somebody has to do that. And I think right now we can learn from each other. What are the prompts that are working the best to get that done? But we're still at the cutting edge. We're still figuring out what works and how do you avoid delusions or hallucinations and racist rants with the answers that they give you. And it's getting better, but it's still not there yet. And I feel like that's a very exciting spot to be on. It can be frustrating because you might think you're doing everything right and you still get an uh, outsized effort or a, a inappropriate answer, but we're close and it's really powerful. And once you put in that work, like a little investment now can hopefully save hours for you and your team later. I, that's what we'll continue to push forward together. And I just ask if you learn something today and you try it on your own, please feedback any learnings that you have to us so we can continue to learn with you and continue to put out um, helpful content to navigate this new world all together. Thank you all for joining. We'll send over the recording and some of these prompts afterwards. If there's other questions, we're going to hang out for a few minutes. So you're welcome to stay on. I'm just going to cut off the recording for now. Have a great rest of your day. I'll talk soon. Thank you. Thank you.